Fusion, the international science radio show. Hello, Lee. Hi, Ian. How's it going, mate? Good. How are you? Yeah, quite good, thank you. Nice to meet you. Lovely to meet you. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. My name is Liam. Uh, I'm not just a chemist. I'm a synthetic chemist. Uh, not exactly the person that sells you your medicine, but maybe the person who makes some of your medicines. For me, um, I'm not just a chemist or a synthetic chemist. I'm a very special type. I'm an organometallic chemist. And what that means is anything to do with special types of metal carbon bonds, I want to know about. And so I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about all the stuff that involves my life as an organometallic chemist and some of the cool things I've seen along the way. Fantastic. So Liam, how did you get interested? Did, was it chemistry first or did you go straight into synthetic chemistry? Yeah, absolutely. So I got interested um, pretty much just in uh, the hard sciences in uh, maybe late high school kind of thing. Uh, particularly, I'd always been interested in like my sciences, my maths and things like that. Um, however, I had a very special mentor um, who was able to answer a lot more of my questions because I was a very uh, inquisitive, to be correct. I was very inquisitive, had lots of questions, probably a little bit annoying at teachers, uh, but I had a special teacher in, at the end of high school who was able to answer those questions as a former chemist himself. Um, and so it was kind of like around year nine or 10 where I thought to myself, you know, I actually really like chemistry and physics. I want to start doing some of my own experiments. Fantastic. And when did you start to specialise or get interested in the more complicated things like the organic, metallic, synthetic chemistry? Absolutely. Um, so it was kind of just uh, an affair of, uh, I guess, narrowing down my interests one year at a time. So if you want to say, like, let's start at year 12. I was interested equally in maths, chemistry, physics and biology. Uh, so, of course, I went into first year of university and studied all four of those things. And at the end of first year, I thought, you know, we're going to have to start eliminating some variables here, as every good scientist does. And unfortunately, at this time, um, I still thought it was very interesting, um, but biology was the first one to go, so to speak. Um, in second year, I knocked off maths. And then right at the end of my degree, I, at the end of my first degree, I had physics and chemistry left. And then obviously, I have tried my absolute hardest to hold on to both of them because I was really torn between the two. Um, but I did choose chemistry in the end, but I managed to hold on to just a little bit of physics as well. And so in my fourth year and my first uh, official research project, I guess, um, I was doing synthetic chemistry, but in terms of um, doing photochemistry. So being able to take light, what you might have as visible light from the sun and convert that into new chemical bonds. So. Yeah, pretty much at the end of my first degree, I was a chemist. However, I held on to just enough physics to tide me over. And uh, of course, as I, uh, a couple of years ago, I started my PhD and it's been pretty much chemistry since then. Yeah. And so what is it you're studying with your PhD? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've always been really obsessed with um, which I'm sure we'll get to at another point as well, is for me, I just, I really want to know fundamentally how chemical bonds work. And that might seem like a really simple idea and it might seem that that might be very easy to go and study as an idea, but that's not really the case these days. So I came to where I am now at the Australian National University to study under my boss, who is one of the experts in metal carbon multiple bonds. Metal carbon single bonds are actually quite common, uh, but as soon as you go to a metal carbon double bond, they become increasingly rarer. And for me, I look at metal carbon triple bonds, which are far more rare. So um, I guess that's sort of uh, what I got into as far as like a very broad area, especially anything to do with metal carbon triple bonds I want to look at, um, like I mentioned. However, um, I also want to now look one step further. If we've got a metal carbon triple bond, um, for any people that have done some sort of chemistry, you might be thinking to yourself, okay, Liam, well, carbon tends to have four bonds. So what's on the other side? So as rare as metal carbon triple bonds are, um, often the one bond that is left over is bonded to another carbon 
or some like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, um, something that's organic, but very, very, well, four people, four or five people in history have asked the question, well, what if we put that missing uh, carbon bond onto another metal? So a metal carbon metal uh, spine is what I look at. They're incredibly rare out of the millions and billions of possible chemicals that there are. As of the other morning, I can tell you there are 129 of those molecules, uh, which I've collated and looked at very closely. Um, and out of those around about 120 molecules, only 40 of them have a metal carbon triple bond in them. And I've made around 25 of them. So quite a specific thing there, but you know, it's the sort of uh, the start of a problem, I guess, uh, which a lot of researchers nowadays are always uh, working towards very noble goals. You know, we're trying to solve cancer. We're trying to um, save the animals inside of Antarctica. These are very easy to see problems. Um, and we know lots about those areas. And so they're at the end where they're trying to solve the actual problem. Whereas me, I'm right at the start. Uh, I'm just trying to understand almost like a chemical explorer. What can we do? What can't we do? And then I look at problems much later on. Um, so for me, I build these molecules. I'm currently testing their reactivity. So what happens if you have a molecule of these rare uh, metal carbon triple bonds sort of thing? And what happens with literally other, literally every other molecule? Do they interact? Do they form new things? And I see what comes out the other side. Um, but I guess if all my wild dreams had to come true, um, you might think to yourself, okay, you've got this nice little spine and we know that metals um, conduct electricity. So you might think to yourself, if you've got a metal carbon metal bond, um, if we antagonize one of those metals with some electrodes, we might be able to put some electrons and change their electronic properties. And those electrons might be able to jump onto the carbon and then jump onto the metal the other side. Um, and that's a very, very, new type of area that's been up and coming maybe in the last uh, eight to 15 years. And it's definitely not been done on these uh, metal carbon metal bonds, as opposed to metals with six or 10 or 20 carbons in between them. Um, these very small atomic wires, a lot of those have been done, but because no one has these much shorter chains like I do, uh, that's what I would like to look at. So if they conduct, you could imagine the smallest atomic wires possible, which means you might be able to get the best electronics possible. If I had a very uh, altruistic goal, uh, that's what I would like to have. <laughs> that's amazing. So the properties you're mainly looking for is conductivity in these new compounds. Yeah, that's the, the main property we're looking at. Um, there's also, uh, you know, lots of, uh, because we don't have these molecules, we don't know how they react properly. However, we have seen these uh, carbon um, atoms in between lots of different metal atoms before. So if you've ever driven a car and you've used uh, petrol in your car, petrol refinement is done via one of these special carbons in amongst a bunch of tungsten atoms sort of thing and other uh, metals like that. And so obviously that's a massive process that everyone uses and we know that it works and we get petrol out the other side, but we don't know perfectly how that happens. So you never know, maybe I might be able to contribute to solving a little bit more of that problem as well. The other big one, of course, is uh, the biggest chemical process uh, around the Haber-Bosch process, which is essentially a man-made version of how plants um, take nitrogen from the air, put it in our fertilizers, make our food and it feeds humanity like we've never been able to uh, imagine, uh, especially a hundred years ago. Um, but we still don't know how those plants take up the nitrogen properly and we haven't been able to emulate that. We're now at a point in the last three years that we have found that inside of plants, there is one of these rare um, single carbons in between six ions. So six ions in like a, like a, a 3D diamond type shape. And at the center of that diamond is this single carbon. Um, and we've seen it in nature, but we haven't been able to replicate it in the lab. Wouldn't it be great if we could? Hello, here I am, let me have a go. <laughs> so yeah, that's um, some of the, um, more of the reactivity that we would like to look at to solve some problems uh, if we could get a little bit further. Yeah. And so what does your average day in the lab look like? Mm. 
Thanks, Ian. That's my, that's my favorite question. Um, a lot of people get caught off guard with this one, actually, um, because, you know, a lot of people are used to like a nine to five uh, sort of work. That's what we think of a work day. So surely you could split up every hour between nine to five and it would work quite nicely. For me, as not just a chemist, but an organometallic chemist, um, metals often take much longer or much shorter if they're silly reactive, uh, typically much longer than normal chemicals to react with one another. So my typical day actually starts at 4 p.m. the day before. So, so four o'clock, you've probably got an hour, hour and a half until it's time to go home. I set all my reactions up there so they can react through the night and I can come in first thing at eight or nine the next morning and see what's happened. So I react mine overnight. Um, they react slow enough that I don't need to come in through the morning and observe them. Um, I can infer that information later. And then you can sort of split the day up into a couple of parts. So I'll spend the morning as soon as I arrive, just letting everything cool down. We often have to heat these things up to encourage them. Um, and so for that first little hour, I come in, look at make observations, uh, and then let them cool down and probably read some papers of what other scientists in my area have been doing. Shortly after that, uh, everything will have cooled down. I'll have written down, you know, yellow change to orange. Uh, the, some of the liquid has evaporated, all these kinds of observations. And I'll have a bit of an idea of whether things have worked or not. I'll be able to say evaporate down some solutions, make up some special samples. I'll put them inside of massive magnets to look at interesting properties that way. And that can tell me some information. I can, uh, it's not really a laser, but I can use an, an infrared beam uh, is another way that I might uh, look and see whether a mixture has converted to something else and gather all of these little pieces of information across lots of different parts of my molecules to build a whole picture of what's happened probably by lunchtime. I've made some sketches and then shortly after lunch, I will uh, prepare what's called a silica column. If you imagine like very fine sand, uh, you can put a crude mixture on the top of that and use things like petrol or nail polish remover, or which is acetone, uh, lots of different um, solutions like that to separate them out. So something that's black or brown is not often black or brown, it's some red, some blue, some green, and all those different colors, I wanna get them pure and on their own. And I spend probably half of the afternoon trying to separate all those colors out because they're all different new compounds. Uh, and then I guess, uh, while this is happening, I'll be looking at the things that I made the day before, analyzing them, building up that story again. And then that brings us pretty much around to 4 p.m. Uh, where I've made some new molecules, I've purified them, uh, and it's time to uh, analyze them through my spare time for the rest of the week, I guess. Um, and that's pretty much what a day looks like for me. Um, obviously balancing some meetings and some teaching um, and stuff like that. Um, that's pretty much my day as an organometallic chemist. Wonderful. And you've been involved with Science Week and Young Tassie Scientists. I have, yeah. I've been involved with a lot of uh, National Science Week uh, projects for quite a while. But of course, my true love and joy was my first organisation, the Young Tassie Scientists. Uh, so I've been with them. This is now my fifth year as a part of that program, which is uh, quite long um, for a lot of people. Um, this, is, this program is run down in Tasmania primarily by um, uh, PhD students. However, um, so people that are in their, yeah, their fourth year or fifth year and probably to their seventh or eighth year of university as researchers. Uh, having said that though, I was quite a keen bean when I arrived at the University of Tasmania uh, a few years ago. Uh, and so I came across this group through friends uh, and I love science communication. That's my other big love. So they let me straight in and I've been uh, doing it ever since. Um, so I guess um, the objective of the Young Tassie Scientists is that we travel around to schools and we communicate these uh, advanced research ideas and the wonderful things that we see as researchers, uh, but in layman's terms, especially, you know, uh, we wanna make sure that everything that we do as researchers, we can communicate to someone who is in kindergarten, someone who's in year five, year 10, year 12, parents, roll the way up to our grandparents. We wanna make sure that it's as easy to understand as possible so we can share all of the cool things that we get to see as researchers. And this year, did you prepare some videos? 
I did. So uh, uh, the, the previous few years, I, I've really prided myself on trying to build models of never seen before things inside of classrooms. So of course, this year that was made a little bit more difficult uh, because of COVID. And of course, I'm now stuck in Canberra. I wasn't able to make it back down to Tasmania because of that. So I went and made some videos this year. Um, so of course, um, I made some videos of, you know, taking people through the lab. This is what my day looks like. Uh, but of course, I really love precious metals and I can't stop talking about the periodic table. So I made a small little mini series of uh, four to five episodes this year of my little web series called Treasure at Home. So not only um, can I send people around their house to look at interesting items, I can teach them about the periodic table as they go. Um, and of course, in the name Treasure at Home, I want to send people around the house to try and find the rarest, most precious, expensive elements that I can that are actually hiding right before their eyes. Um, and of course, in episode one, we covered uh, what is quite probably the easiest uh, because people don't know that there's lots of it in their house uh, and everyone knows how rare and expensive gold is. So wouldn't it be great to find some of that? And yeah, as a bit of a hint, we found quite a lot and there's quite a lot actually living probably behind your TV cabinet. Um, but that was my little web series that I did this year, Treasure at Home. Um, and what other sorts of things have you been doing for Science Week? Um, so you go to classrooms and you've been building models and you've been doing videos. Um, what's next? Yeah, of course. Um, so for me this year, I've sort of uh, wound up, especially being outside of uh, Tasmania. The young Tassie scientists primarily do their work there and obviously we move online. So this year it's been a little bit uh, impeded as far as myself personally with the program. But of course, I've done another four, four years of that beforehand and I've done so many things for the program. So one of the coolest things that I've got to do is uh, be a science show uh, demonstrator for the Festival of Bright Ideas or FOBI. It's uh, down on the Hobart Wharf. Uh, there's lots of science um, companies and organisations that come together all one, under, under one roof over a weekend to show what they do. Uh, and I gave a few science shows uh, assisting the great Dr. Jeremy Just, who is also a young Tassie scientist um, and who has done a lot of work with Questacon as well. So I got to do that a couple of times um, to make lots of explosions, lots of bubbles, uh, all sorts of stuff that you would expect with a, a magnificent science show. So that's probably the coolest thing I've done. I also go around to, um, to schools as well and act as a judge in their science competitions. So when you're in like year nine, 10, 11, 12, you might be doing uh, like these young investigator type programs where obviously you have your science classes, you prepare a poster, and I would come around as a, as a guest judge, especially for chemistry and physics types uh, problems. Um, you know, just to come around and assess and um, everything of, you know, this is a cool poster, this is a cool idea. Uh, and then also, you know, to be able to sit down as an ex a researcher myself and start to ask those important questions, like here's some work, um, where do you think we can go from here? What can we make out of this? Um, and that's probably the coolest thing for me because uh, it gives me a chance to interact with high school students that I know that I would have really liked when I was their age, just to have a researcher come in and look at your, my very first piece of science um, and build up those hidden skills as a researcher as well, communicating your work. Wonderful. Do you have any um, other stories you'd like to share? Uh, yeah, I've got a, a few of them. Um, I'm just trying to, there's one uh, really good one. We'll, we'll go into that one first. Um, so I, I have a, um, I often like to sit back and reflect on the key moments of, of my uh, journey as a researcher and as a chemist and of course, as a scientist. Um, and I, the thing I really like about science that we don't touch on enough is I, I refer to it as the wheel of science. It's about finding a mentor they mentor you and there comes a natural time when you have to mentor someone else. And so I guess through the Young Tassie Scientist Program, I had that uh, very special moment and experience very early on, just as a, a third year um, university student. So I hadn't even become technically a scientist yet, but I got to have my mentoring moment. Um, and for me, um, my science journey, uh, as a quick background, my science journey began when I was six years old. Uh, I'm one of those. Uh, interesting kids, I guess. I told my grandparents at six years old, uh, Nan, I want to be an inventor scientist, quote unquote. 
Uh, and I didn't quite know what that meant, but I think I've kind of kept to that. And so for me, um, being a, a young Tasmanian boy uh, in the northwest coast of Tasmania, um, I've always wanted to go to university to become a scientist. And so for me, when I arrived at the University of Tasmania for my first laboratory session, I put on my UTAS lab coat and I saw the Lion logo and I can't describe that feeling of putting it on. I'll never forget that. Uh, it's one of my happiest memories of my entire life. So when I got to go out for uh, a couple of years later for the Young Tassie Scientists, I obviously take some UTAS lab coats for my special little helpers uh, in these primary schools. And we went to a, a school up in, uh, in Boat Harbour, a small seaside town in Northwest Tasmania, where I'm from. Uh, and this little kid comes up to me and says, oh my God, it's you, you're finally here. Uh, you know, you get, um, obviously everyone's normally really excited, uh, but the teacher has to warn you that there's this, this uh, little kid who knows exactly that you're coming, he knows everything about you, has so many questions. And so I got to ask him, you know, um, yeah, little guy, do you, uh, do you want to be uh, my assistant for the day? And obviously his uh, eyes just lit up. We folded up the big uh, Utah's lab coat for him and put it over him. And that was probably the most special moment of my communication life because as he pulls the collar up and over, he looks down on the lapel and sees the logo and does exactly the same reaction that I'd done two years ago uh, as a grown man. So um, to see a little kid have that moment of, you know what, I'm gonna be a scientist as well. Um, words can't just to, to, to describe things like that. And I've had many experiences of that caliber, uh, especially with the young Tassie scientists. It's a phenomenal program, uh, especially to see little kids have magic moments like that through us. Very rewarding. Yeah, of course. <laughs> So I guess one more other thing is that I could talk about is um, we've talked a little bit about my research and some of the science communication stuff that I've done. Um, but I've actually been involved with quite a number of other chemistry projects. So I mentioned that I am an organometallic chemist nowadays, and I guess that is what I'll probably be much into the future. Um, and I've also mentioned that I was quite a keen bean when I first arrived at university. So as soon as I arrived, obviously I loved my lectures. I was so happy to be learning about all these things. So I kept pestering uh, these lecturers saying, you know, can I come in the lab? Can I come and have a look at what really happens? And um, I'm sure it got quite annoying, but I pestered them for a good uh, eight or nine months. And then all of a sudden I was able to use my spare time in between lectures to go and volunteer as an undergraduate researcher in my first year. So I was straight into the lab, um, got to play with some medals for the first time and uh, I started out even my very first project was on metals as an organometallic chemist and that was great and then that project sort of ended I worked over uh, the summer there in between the university semesters um, so for a couple of months and then that sort of project ended at the start of my second year and I was like well you know what uh, I haven't quite had enough here uh, and so I got picked up by another group as an organic chemist so no metals allowed now purely as an organic chemist um, and I got to work with natural products. So as a part of that project, rather than using, trying to make these metal carbon bonds and stuff like that, I was trying to make carbon carbon bonds. Um, and not just that, but extracting very valuable chemicals out of native Tasmanian plants. So obviously it's no, no lie, I really love Tasmania. So to be able to play a very, very small role in something like that was amazing. Um, but, you know, I'd be doing very different things to what I was used to at the time and definitely what I'm used to now is, you know, people, uh, especially like biologists and botanists and people in the plants department would go off to all sorts of mountains and wilderness areas and pick these um, native Tasmanian plants um, um, as part of uh, their work. And then they'd bring some to us and we would dry them out and let them sit in the sunshine. And then, you know, we would put them inside of a big blender, essentially and like crush them all up like what you might uh, use in your kitchen for oregano and stuff like that, put them in a spice grinder. And then we would put all of these, uh, we would actually run them through a coffee machine, which was a terrific uh, little idea um, that was happening at the University of Tasmania at the time, still is. And we would essentially take these native Tasmanian plants and uh, run them through a coffee machine with um, essentially vodka, actually, you know, like, uh, a mixture of ethanol and water, essentially with vodka, and we'd get this lovely green and brown mixture out on the other side, and we would be able to uh, separate all of the very rare compounds out of there and then look at their reactivity. So as a researcher, or as a, um, a volunteer researcher, I was helping the PhD students at the time, 
And so I would extract some chemicals and they would help me do small reactions as part of to make up for their thesis. So that was another very different area. Um, that project came to an end um, and I had a very, um, he's still uh, my best mentor um, uh, up until today. Um, but my supervisor uh, through that project, um, I stayed with his group, but he said, it'd be great if we could send you out to all the other groups. So after that, I went and worked on some plastics, which is obviously different again, um, trying to take these small little molecules and put them all together in a big long chain um, to make a polymer or a plastic, um, stuff like that, that the CSIRO started in Australia and have uh, won numerous awards for, giving us our lovely banknotes. Um, so I got to have a, a bit of a go at making like some unique plastics as well. And then after that, I came back and got into a bit of the, uh, what I mentioned uh, another time with photoreactors. So being able to use um, uh, blue LEDs and green LEDs, uh, visible light to make new chemical bonds. Um, and I like building things. I build things with my hands. That's what I do. So at that time, I was actually building these photoreactors uh, at the start of my third year. And that's obviously now become quite a, quite a nice area down there. And um, I kept doing that for quite a while in amongst other projects. So I guess that I was really lucky to have something like that because I'd done, apart from say analytical chemistry, like measuring uh, toxic bits in water and separating out DNA and electrodes and stuff like that. I hadn't done as much as that, but as far as synthetic chemistry goes, so making new molecules, I'd done almost all of them before I'd got into, I guess, uh, official research, so to speak. So I got to see so much before I actually got to, before my time, I guess. And I've got so many wonderful memories from all of those times. <laughs> and it all came together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, which is, I guess, something, it's really starting to pay dividends now. Um, being in a PhD, you're obviously, uh, you're at the forefront. You're becoming the expert in your small little area. So I guess, I mean, I'm, I, I, uh, easily get distracted by new and fascinating ideas, even when they, uh, sometimes my boss might suggest to me, this isn't of our biggest concern, uh, but I still like to connect these dots of all these different areas that lots of people haven't done, but I've had little tasters, I guess, of all the areas. So I really pride myself on my ability to connect the dots that other people would have trouble with because they've not done those multiple areas. So, yeah, it's absolutely paid dividends. It's really rewarding. <laughs> Would you have any advice for students that are thinking of trying to follow your path into chemistry? Absolutely. Yeah, pretty much, um, pretty much science in general. Um, so um, as far as following the path of being a scientist, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty uh, clear cut. All you need to do to, I guess, start off a science career is it's just as easy as going largely to university and doing a general science degree, like your Bachelor of Science or Bachelor of Marine Studies or something like that. Um, and the best thing to do if you're doing one of those is you can do lots of different subjects in your first year of university. And I almost guarantee you, if you think you like science, um, there's a very high chance you'll find what you're looking for in that first year. Um, but having said that though, um, I'm also, um, I've done quite a lot of work as a senior student ambassador um, especially for the ANU. So again, using those skills to go into schools, talk to year 11, 10, 11 and 12 kids about applying to uni and choosing your courses and all that stuff like that. Um, and I, I find through that, that a lot of people get a lot of pressure on them to sort of choose in year 12. And I think that's a bit unrealistic, you know, like it's like, you know, you have to choose in year 12, um, you know, and for me, as you can, as, uh, I'd love to say I really didn't choose that I was going to be a chemist until technically I had finished university. I'd done all three years and at the end I was a chemist and I made my choice then, not year 12. That's a very bad idea. I think we lose a lot of people in science and I want to see you at uni. If you like a bit of science, choose it. It's not for everyone, but I think that that would be better. So keep a very open mind because it is, it's just impossible to know how much good science there is out there if you're in year 10, 11 or 12. Don't make your choice then, have a taste, have a play around, make your choice later. That's probably the best advice I have. I think they're very wise words. Well, Liam, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, no worries. Thank you so much for having me, Ian. It's been a delight to have a chat. It's been fun. And look, 